Hello, and thank you for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul uh, from Texas A&M University, Kingsville, and this presentation is called Style in Writing Characters, and it's essentially a counterpart to a, another presentation I made called Style in Writing Actors. As with the other presentation, uh, the material here is uh, based on and largely taken from the book Style, Lessons in Clarity and Grace by Joseph Williams, um, with my explanations and uh, clarifications hopefully added. Um, and so if you want more information, of course, that's the source to go to. It also has additional exercises, so a very useful resource. Let's review the two initial principles of clarity that I introduced in the uh, actions video. The first was, and that we talked about in that video, put the important actions in verbs. The second principle will be our, fo our focus in this presentation, and that's making the main characters, the main characters of your story, the main characters that you're talking about, make them the subject of those verbs so that they are doing the actions. Continuing with our review from the previous presentation, the basics of a sentence. A uh, sentence has a subject and a predicate. The predicate is just the name for the second half of the sentence, everything that's not the subject, and it includes the verb. The verb is technically only one part of the predicate, but subject, verb, subject, predicate. These are the essential components of a sentence. In the last presentation, I talked about the subject as the actor and the predicate or verb as the action, uh, and that is true. Another way to think about it is the subject is the sentence, is, is what the sentence is about, and the predicate is what is said about the subject, what is predicated about the subject. So let's see what that means. Arnold likes to go dancing. So subject here is Arnold. That's, what, that's who we're talking about. What we're saying about Arnold is that he likes to go dancing. So that's our predicate. And the verb here is just the word like. So the subject is Arnold, verb is likes, and it's part of the whole predicate, likes to go dancing, which describes what Arnold does. Another example, the store on the corner of Main and First sells greeting cards. So the subject of this sentence, what the sentence is about, it's about the store on the corner of Main and First. Uh, and that's the whole subject. We could reduce it to its simple subject or, or narrow it down to its simple subject, which is just the store. We could omit the whole phrase on the corner of Main and First and the sentence would still make grammatical sense, even though we'd lose information. But what is being said about the store on the corner of Main and First? What's being said is that it sells greeting cards. That's what is being predicated of it. Um, and the verb that's part of that predicate is sells. So the store sells. Now the counterpart to subject and predicate or subject and verb is character and action. Whereas subject and predicate or subject and verb, those are all grammatical terms. Character and action are storytelling terms. And even if you are telling uh, uh, writing about something factual like a scientific experiment or something like that you're still telling a story so the focus is going to be on the character and actions that's what your readers want to know the character of course is the person in the story or narrative it doesn't have to be a literal flesh and blood person it can be an institution it can be a a building it can be a place but it's the figure in your story and the action is what the characters are doing. So the characters perform actions, and that's what you want to focus on. The trick comes in to making sure your characters and your actions are complementary to your subjects and predicates. So let's see what that means. So subject and predicate, again, as grammatical terms, these have a fixed order. This is essentially a grammatical law or grammatical rule about the normal structure of sentences in English. The subject goes first and then the predicate. It's just the way we read and interpret sentences in English. So that's a fixed order. However, the character in action, because those are storytelling elements and not grammatical elements, they can go in any order. They don't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to put the character first and then the action. Um, 
So characters and actions can go anywhere in a sentence. They're not tied to the grammatical structure of a sentence in any way. So that's the problem when the subject and predicate, since they are fixed, do not line up with the character and action, which are variable. Ideally, as we have here, the subjects of your sentences are the characters in your story. The, the, what you're talking about in the sentences are the, the people or figures that are active in your story. And ideally, what you're saying about them, what you're predicating about them, is you're saying what they do. What actions are they taking? So if you're writing a paper about the Civil War, your characters might be soldiers or politicians. The actions might be various uh, uh, laws they pass or battles they take or letters they write, speeches they make, etc., etc. You want to make sure that your sentences, the subjects are those people and the predicates are those actions rather than some other phrase or word. One last bit of review from the last presentation on nouns. There are abstract nouns and concrete nouns, and this is important for thinking about your characters because most of the time, not all the time, but for the most part, people generally write about concrete characters, characters that are, if not flesh and blood people, things that you can point to, something that can be identified through the senses. Um, so that's a concrete noun. So a phone, a noise, John, the park, the sun, the wind, even though we can't see the wind, these are all things that are concrete in the sense that we sense them. They have a material existence in the world. Um, and usually your characters are concrete nouns. Sometimes your characters are abstract nouns. These are concepts or ideas, things that can't be identified through the senses. Courage, education, ignorance, analysis, ugliness. Notice that a lot of these are also nominalizations. Uh, those that is a verb or adjective that's been turned into a noun. Sometimes you will be writing uh, with abstract nouns as your characters. You will have abstract characters, but oftentimes not. Oftentimes uh, an abstract noun is really just a way to hide the character and hide the action. So you want to be careful. What is your character? What's doing the action in your story? Is it an abstract figure or a concrete figure? Let's look at some specific examples so we can start putting this principle into play. Let's compare these two sentences. The CIA feared the president would recommend to Congress that it reduce its budget. Second sentence, the CIA had fears that the president would send a recommendation to Congress that it make a reduction in its budget. So which one of these do you think is more clear, more direct, easier to understand, a more uh, straightforward and informative communicative sentence, and why? So if we were to diagnose this, um, we would notice that in the second sentence, the verbs and the actions are not matched. We have these empty verbs and nominalizations rather than actual actions. So whereas the first sentence says feared, the second one said had fears. Would recommend versus would send a recommendation. Reduce versus make a reduction. So the second sentence is, is not only wordier, but it sort of hides the actions um, and, and puts them in nouns uh, subject to or uh, that are the objects of empty verbs. But even despite this, even though the second sentence is weaker and you would preferably write the first sentence, it's still relatively clear. It's not super hard to understand. And that's because it's only the verbs and the actions that are not matched or the predicate and the actions that aren't matched. Let's compare that second sentence with a third one. The CIA had fears that the president would send a recommendation to Congress that it make a reduction in its budget. And now let's look at this third one. The fear of the CIA was that a recommendation from the president to Congress would be for a reduction in its budget. Now, which one of those is more clear? 
and more communicative, more easy uh, or easier to understand um, the second or the third. So obviously the third sentence is much less clear than the first or the second. Um, much harder to understand what's going on. Why is that? Because while the second sentence had the verbs and the actions misaligned, it still had the characters in the right place. The characters were the subjects of the sentences. In this third sentence, we have abstract characters that are not really the subject of the story, not really subject of what's the, the important part of what's being told, rather than concrete characters who are the actual agents of uh, the events that are being described. We can represent the difference between these three sentences in a very simple visual uh, lineup. The first sentence, we've got the subject and the verb, or the subject and the predicate. So the CIA feared the president would recommend it, that is Congress, reduce. The characters are clearly identified and the actions that they're taking are clearly identified. We know who is doing what. The second sentence, same breakdown. The CIA had fears. The president would send a recommendation. It, Congress, make a reduction. So the characters are still clearly identified. The CIA, the president, it, those are the actors. Those are the, the agents uh, in the story and the things people or, or characters we're talking about, but the actions are hidden in nominalizations. Fears rather than feared, recommendation rather than recommend, uh, and reduction rather than reduce. But again, characters are identified, so we can still understand what's happening, even if it's a little wordy. Third sentence. Uh, now, if we look at this, the subject is the fear, and it, the verb what is was. And then the second subject is a recommendation would be. Completely contentless in a certain sense. A, a fear was, a recommendation would be. Those are empty verbs. They're just forms of the verb to be. They don't tell us anything about what is happening in the story. They don't tell us who is doing those actions. The characters are hidden in prepositional phrases of the CIA from the president to Congress. And because they're prepositional phrases, they could all be removed from the sentence. And it would still be a grammatical, uh, grammatically correct sentence. And the actions, as in the previous example, are hidden in nominalizations, fear, recommendation, reduction. So that's why this sentence is so unclear. We don't know who is involved and we don't know what they're doing. Here's one more example. Now this is the ultimate uh, bad revision of this statement. There was a fear that there would be a recommendation for a budget reduction. That is a grammatically correct sentence. It does in some sense convey uh, some of the ideas from the previous examples, from that first one that was the most clear, but notice just how hard it is to understand what's happening because again we have the actions hidden in nominalizations but now we don't even have the actors at all we don't have the characters of our story at all who is who has this fear who is making this recommendation who is making the reduction none of these are told in the sentence making it very hard to to really know what we're trying to learn what is being what's being communicated by it so this is the ultimate example of how characters can be obscured to make a sentence essentially um, almost meaningless. Okay. Let's go through uh, the process of actually revising a sentence, um, looking for these kinds of problems and seeing how we can fix them. So the step one, of course, just as with revising uh, your sentences to highlight the actions, is to skim the first seven or eight words. And what you're looking for are abstract nouns as subjects. Sometimes that's appropriate, but a lot of times it's not. Um, and especially nominalizations as subjects. Nominalizations are, of course, 
forms of abstract nouns. They are concepts rather than physical things. So if you see these as the subject of the sentence, that's a uh, perhaps a red flag that you need to do some revising. Here's an example. Governmental intervention in fast changing technologies has led to the distortion of market evolution and interference in new product development. Very impersonal, very indirect, um, a little uh, pretty unclear as to what exactly is happening and by whom. So if we look first few uh, words, first seven or eight words of the sentence, governmental intervention in fast changing technologies has led. So do we see any nominalizations or abstract nouns being used as the subject of the sentence? So the subject is intervention or governmental intervention, and that's a nominalization. It's an abstract noun. Also, we might note governmental is an adjective made from a noun. The, the word government then turned into um, uh, an adjective governmental. And of course, government is a nominalization of the verb govern. So it's a sort of double abstraction, the word governmental. So now that you've uh, looked and found uh, that there is a problem in the sentence, we've got um, uh, abstract noun as our subject, anomalization as our subject, that is not the actual character of the story. The first step is to find the main characters. Look through the sentence and see what are things, uh, beings, people, either flesh and blood or other figures that could serve as the main characters of the story. That is, who or what are we really talking about in this sentence? These main characters can be hidden in a lot of ways. They can be hidden in possessive pronouns like their, mine, yours, things like that. Um, they can be in nominalizations or attached to nominalizations, as we'll see in a moment. Um, they could be the objects of prepositions. We've seen that in some of our examples. Or they could be implied or unstated altogether. They might not even be in the sentence, in which case you have to try to figure out who is the character that you're talking about. So if we look at the example, again, we see in the phrase governmental intervention, uh, who is, that's the, the agent there, the actor, the character is the government. Um, they're the ones that are making this intervention. So here, the character government is used as an adjective, governmental, attached to the nominalization intervention. So government versus governmental. Any other actors in the sentence, any other characters things that are uh, uh, beings that are doing some sort of activity. Well, in the phrase of market evolution, again, we have the same thing, the noun market being used as an adjective. It's in a prepositional phrase, so it could be grammatically removed from the sentence, and it's with the nominalization evolution, which is a, a noun form of the verb evolve. So of market evolution is hiding the character market. So we've identified two possible characters in the story of this sentence, the government and the market. Now, next step, once we've got the uh, characters, we know who the characters are, we have to identify what are the actions that the characters are performing and then match the characters to the actions uh, in, in terms of the grammatical structure, the subject predicate structure. So who is doing what in this sentence? Governmental intervention in fast changing technologies has led to the distortion of market evolution and interference in new product development. Well, we would want to look for all the nominalizations, all the actions that have been turned into, into nouns, uh, since we've already now found the characters that have been turned into uh, other, other words. So governmental intervention hides the, the action intervenes. Distortion is distorts, evolution, evolve, interference, interferes, development, develop. Those are all actions that have been turned into nouns. And who's doing each of these actions? Well, it's the government that's intervening and thus also distorting. It's the markets that are, or as the case may be, are not evolving. Uh, and that is due to the way the government is interfering the government interferes in uh, the market and the markets develop or do not develop. 
So we find that the government is, is performing all of these actions, the markets are performing all of these actions, but it was completely hidden in the way the sentence was originally written. So now, now that we've matched our characters and our actions, um, we reassemble it into a new sentence, putting the characters as subjects and the actions as verbs, and using clauses such as if, although, because, when, how, and why, uh, to clarify the logical relationships between the different characters and actions in the sentence. So let's see how would we revise that previous, uh, this ex uh, one example that we're working with. When a government intervenes in fast changing technologies, it distorts how markets evolve and intervenes, or excuse me, interferes with their ability to develop new products. Notice how much clearer this is than the previous one. The previous sentence, it was the previous version, it was really hard to understand what exactly was happening. It sounded like something bad was happening to the market, but it was sort of unclear to try to figure out what was actually going on and what the cause of it was. This sentence, this uh, revised version, by clearly identifying the characters and the actions, gives us a cause and effect, gives us an actual statement of an action on the part of the government that affects another action on the part of the markets, um, and so forth. So we see the characters, we see the actions, we know what's happening. Let's do one more. Medieval theological debates are often, excuse me, medieval theological debates often addressed issues considered trivial by modern philosophical thought. Um, actually not a super hard sentence to understand, but it could be better because who are the characters that we have or who are the subjects of this uh, uh, sentence? Well, debates. And what are the debates? The debates addressed. Well, a debate's not a character. A, a, a debate's not a flesh and blood person. It's an abstract concept. Um, and the other character we have is thought considered. Right? It's the uh, modern philosophical thought is considering the issues trivial. So, and again, thought is not a, a concrete noun. It's an abstract noun. It's a concept. So debates addressed, thought considered. These are, are uh, somewhat obscure, somewhat unclear in terms of what actually is being said. So if we remember that characters can be hidden in adjectives, we can identify who the actual characters, actors are, and what they're doing. So theological debates, well, who is doing the debates? The theologians. Those are, those are the people who make theological debates. So theologians debate rather than theological debates. Considered by ph philosophical thought, who has philosophical thought? Philosophers. So the philosophers are considering. They're the ones doing the considering. Very simple revision. Medieval theologians often debated issues that modern philosophers consider trivial. The basic idea that ideas in the Middle Ages are now uh, considered to be trivial is communicated fairly effectively in both sentences. But the second version is still better because it identifies the actors, who's doing the debating, who's identifying these things as trivial. Um, and it's just much clearer because it identifies the characters uh, and thus gives us a better sense of what was really happening, um, who is making these decisions, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I've been saying that generally you want your characters to be concrete nouns, concrete figures, uh, but sometimes you will be writing about abstractions. You'll either need to or you might want to do so. Um, characters need not be concrete flesh and blood characters. They don't have to be people. They don't have to necessarily be actual things or forces that you can identify in the world. world. Um, Abstractions and nominalizations can be the main characters, but you have to be careful and make sure that you're using them as the subjects of active verbs, not 
putting them in prepositional phrases and so forth. So if you're going to use an abstraction as a character, just as you would with a concrete noun, you make sure that it's the subject of the sentence. So here's an example. No right is more basic to a free society than freedom of speech. Free speech served the left in the 1960s when it protested the Vietnam War, and it is now used by the right when it claims that speech includes contributions to political organizations. The doctrine of free speech has been embraced by all sides to protect themselves against those who would silence unpopular views. Now, in this example, free speech or freedom of speech and various synonyms for that phrase is essentially a virtual character. It's so familiar to all of us, to most people, I would say, um, even if it might be hard to define legally, but most people have a sense of the concept that it's going to be a virtual character. We're going to understand it as a, a, a concept in itself. And it's involved in specific actions. Served, is used, has been embraced, arose. So it's not being hidden in uh, uh prepositional phrases, etc., etc. It's the main subject of the sentence. Now, you might notice that we have phrases like is used, has been embraced. Those are uh, uh, examples of the passive voice in which the actor, right, the, the free speech is being used by someone else. It's not doing the using. It is being embraced by someone else, not doing the embracing. Normally, passive voice is uh, weaker, that's the sort of general wisdom, but sometimes it can be very effective, as I'll discuss later in this presentation. And here, what's effective about it, and the reason why it's used, is because it gives us a consistent story. Free speech is the subject of the whole paragraph, and so by using these passive voice constructions, we're able to keep that concept, that character, at the forefront of our sentences. So readers do often prefer and expect concrete flesh and blood characters. Um, so that's, in general, a lot of times if there is a concrete flesh and blood character that you can talk about or that you're focusing on, you want to make sure they're your, your subjects. But when you're writing about abstractions, which you may need to do um, and may want to do again, make sure you use them as characters. That is, make them the subjects of the sentence, the subjects of the active verbs in the sentence. Um, it's best if you're using a, a familiar abstraction like freedom of speech or freedom of religion or something like that, um, rather than an unfamiliar ab ab abstraction, something such as existentialism, which many people might not know what that means. Um, so if you are writing about an unfamiliar concept, you want to avoid using other unfamiliar abstractions and concepts, right? Um, if it's something familiar that people know, you can have a little bit more leeway to, to introduce other complex ideas. But if it's a complex idea and unfamiliar in itself, you don't want to pile on to your readers. Um, and finally, sometimes revising an abstract passage can be really difficult if the main character is just people in general. Sometimes um, a passage might be somewhat abstract because it's not talking about a specific group, it's just talking about what people do or what happens in general. Uh, and we might see some examples of that, but um, just keep that in mind. Sometimes the passage just needs to be a little bit more abstract. So now let's talk about passive voice and its use in sentences. So first, let's define these things. Active voice is when the agent or the source of the action verb is in the subject. So the subject of the sentence is the, the doer of the action. And the goal or receiver of the action, the thing being affected by the subject's uh, uh, activity, is in the direct object or sometimes indirect object of the sentence. So very simple examples. I lost the money. I am the subject. The action that I performed is losing. Uh, and what the thing that I lost is the money. 
Felicia broke the window. Felicia is the agent of the action. The action she's performing is breaking the thing that she is breaking. The, the uh, object of the activity that Felicia performs is the window. The storm flooded the entire town. Again, storm is the subject and the agent of the verb. Um, the verb, the action is flooded and what is being flooded is the entire town. So this is the standard way we, we tend to talk and write, simple, basic sentence structure. Now in, in passive voice, essentially what happens is that the agent of the action, the doer, and the object of the action, the thing that is done to, are reversed. So the subject of the sentence names the goal of the action rather than the source of the action. What, what the action, what is the recipient of the action rather than the, the agent that performs it. Uh, and the agent or source of the action is then put in a by phrase, or it can be omitted altogether, as we've seen. Um, and the verb changes also. We have a form of the verb to be preceding it in what becomes what's called the past participle form. Those technical terms aren't necessarily important. You'll see what I mean when we look at the example. So let's transform those three examples from before. Instead of I lost the money, the money was lost by me. Instead of Felicia broke the window, the window was broken by Felicia. And instead of the storm flooded the entire town, the entire town was flooded by the storm. And notice that we don't even need to include the by me, by Felicia, by the storm. <laughs> we could just say the money was lost, the window was broken, the entire town was flooded. We could just say that the sentence would be correct. We wouldn't even know who the characters are, who the agents of these actions are. So this is passive voice. And you can see what we mean, the, how the verb is changed into the, um, rather than uh, I lost, was lost. Broke, was broken. Flooded, was flooded. So that's the way the verb is also transformed. The problem of passive voice or the danger of passive voice is that, and we saw this in the previous example about the CIA and the budget recommendation, uh, we can totally omit the characters. The characters could be completely absent from the sentence and it could still be grammatically correct. A decision was made in favor of doing a study of the disagreements. Well, who decided? Uh, who's gonna do the study? Who's disagreeing? We have no idea because it's all omitted from the sentence. So this is an example of where passive voice really goes bad. If we think about it, this sentence can mean all sorts of different things. It could be saying that we decided that I should study why they disagreed. It could be saying I decided that you should study why he disagreed. They decided I should study why you disagreed. We decided that we should study why we disagreed, right? It could be all sorts of different things because we don't know who's doing any of these actions. As I said before, the conventional wisdom is that active voice is superior to passive voice. And as a rule of thumb, you want to try to make sure your verbs are active and your characters are the subjects. You want to make sure that, that you do write in active voice because it is often better. But Passive voice can be very useful in certain situations. Again, just like with nominalizations. If it was something that was always bad, it wouldn't even be part of the language. We can do it in the language because it can sometimes be useful to convey information in a particular way. So, deciding on whether to use active or passive. Um, do the readers absolutely need to know who is responsible for the action? Again, most of the time you want your readers to know who is responsible for the action because that's who you're talking about. But sometimes we omit the agent of the action if it's unknown or if it's unimportant, if it's not a, a big deal, if it doesn't matter who did the action. So for example, the president was rumored to have considered resigning. Well, we don't know who spread those rumors. Um, so we just say the president was rumored. The rumors were going around, lots of people said it. Um, we don't know the individual person who started it, so we say the president was rumored. Those who are found guilty can be fined. Well, we know who makes judgments of guilt and who issues fines. We don't need to know, uh, we don't need to include the agent 
of the court. Those who are found guilty in a court of law can be fined by the government. There's, it's uh, totally clear to your readers who the agents are. Valuable records should always be kept in a safe. Again, it doesn't matter who the agent is because this is uh, general advice for all people, right? It's just a sort of people in general thing. So in these kinds of general statements, we see that passive voice is useful, right? We don't need to say valuable records should, uh, you should always keep valuable records in a safe or people should always keep valuable records in a safe. Just, right, the passive voice eliminates the need for that general subject. Of course, sometimes passive voice can be used to obscure the agent, um, especially if it's the writer. But sometimes if you want to hide the agent, again, this can be a problem um, or a way to avoid uh, liability. The president was rumored to have considered resigning. Well, it could be that we don't know who started the rumors, but perhaps we want to protect the source's identi identity. We don't want to reveal where the rumors came from. Because the test was not done, the flaw was uncorrected. Well, in this case, I didn't finish the test or correct the flaw, but I want to avoid blame. So I just say these things happened rather than saying who did it rather, or the fact that I didn't do what I was supposed to do. Uh, and finally, mistakes were made, which is an extremely popular political phrase, uh, a way to avoid admitting guilt. Mistakes were made as if just these things happened on their own as if they weren't the active choice on the part of a politician or official. So these are all ways that passive voice can be used to obscure the agent, to uh, uh, hide blame, to avoid responsibility. Another uh, reason for using active or passive, or another question to ask yourself about active or passive, which form of the verb active or passive, would help readers move more smoothly from one sentence to the next. So now we're thinking about not just an individual sentence, but how your writing proceeds, progresses from one sentence to the next, from one phrase to the next, from one paragraph to the next. Uh, so when we read a sentence, we expect the beginnings to provide the important context that we need to understand what's being said. We expect to have our main character told to us. And sentences can be very confusing when they open with new or unexpected information. That is, if uh, particularly if it's a new or unexpected character that we weren't, uh, we weren't aware was going to be part of the story. Let's look at an example. We must decide whether to improve education in the sciences alone or to raise the level of education across the whole curriculum. That's a fairly uh, straightforward sentence. We must decide so we know who the characters are. We must decide if we're going to improve or raise, right? Uh, second sentence is where the problem arises. The weight given to industrial competitiveness as opposed to the value we attach to the liberal arts will determine our decision. So notice how the subject of the second sentence, the weight given, blah, 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 is a completely new concept. It's all new information. It's not mentioned at all in the previous sentence. And it does have, we do have an active verb here. The weight will determine our decision. And this our decision, that's the object of the second sentence, but it's also the only familiar information that we have. It's the only thing that's explicitly connected to the previous sentence which had started with, we must decide. So here's a revision of it in which passive voice actually makes it easier to understand what's being said. We must decide whether to improve education in the sciences alone or to raise the level of education across the whole curriculum. Our decision will be determined by the weight we give to industrial competitiveness as opposed to the value we attach to the liberal arts. So notice how we must decide is then echoed by our decision. So the subject of the second sentence is now familiar information. It's the context that we're familiar with, that we understand. So then that makes the new information easier for us to process. We have the passive voice, passive verb, because the decision is not doing the, the action. The decision is being affected by the action or actually by the subject. And the subject, uh, uh, the the agent of determining, is made the object. So it's this. It's in the um, second half of the sentence. 
the new information then prepared for we're prepared for it by the echo the repetition of the familiar information also active or passive a third reason that you might consider using passive which form active or passive gives readers a more consistent and appropriate point of view that is keeps us focused on the characters that you want your care your readers to focus on so if we think back to that freedom of speech passage a few slides back the freedom of speech or free speech was our main character and in order to keep that in the forefront of our readers minds making it the subject of all the sentences there were a few where passive voice was used so that we could keep the focus on the main character here's another example by early 1945, the Allies had essentially defeated Germany. All that remained was a bloody climax. American, French, British, and Russian forces had breached its borders and were bombing it around the clock. But they had not yet so devastated Germany as to destroy its ability to resist. So what's the point of view of this passage? That is, who are the characters that we're talking about and what are the actions that they're taking? So this passage is written from the point of view of the allies, so it makes them the subjects of active verbs. The passage is about telling us what the allies were doing. The allies had defeated. American, French, British, and Russian forces had breached and were bombing. They had not devastated. So same subject in throughout the passage, active verbs. It gives us a consistent, uh, a consistent point of view, so useful. But now, what if we wanted to write the passage differently? Here's a version of the passage where, rather than the Allies being our main characters, Germany is our main character. By early 1945, Germany had essentially been defeated. All that remained was a bloody climax. Its borders had been breached, and it was being bombed around the clock. It had not been so devastated, however, that it could not resist. So how does the story change a little bit here? Um, it's still the same events, but now we're seeing them from a different perspective. Rather than what the Allies are doing to Germany, we're seeing how Germany has been affected by the Allied attack. So the subject here is Germany, and the verbs are mostly passive. Germany had been defeated. Its borders had been breached. It was being bombed. It had not been devastated. It resists or it could resist um, and notice here that the agents are pretty much left out we don't see we don't have mentions of the allies or the american british french russian troops um, because we know again if you know anything about world war ii you know who's at war with germany you know it was the allied forces against germany so we don't even really need to include the character um, in these passive constructions because our readers gonna know who who we're talking about now, what you don't want to do is just switch characters and perspectives for no reason, because that will create confusion. So if you're going to write about the allies, make sure the allies are the subject of all the sentences. If you're going to write about Germany, make sure Germany is the subject of all your sentences. Don't switch back and forth, as we see in this one. By early 1945, the allies had essentially defeated Germany. Its borders had been breached, and they were bombing it around the clock. Germany was not so devastated, however, that the Allies would meet with no resistance. Though Germany's population was demoralized, the Allies still attacked German cities from the air. This is very confusing, not least of which because the second sentence seems to suggest that uh, Germany's own borders were bombing it because of the grammatical oddness. But just look at how all the characters and actions are switching around. The Allies had defeated its borders had been its that is germany's borders had been breached they the allies were bombing germany was not devastated the allies would meet germany's population was demoralized the allies attacked so very confusing by this jumping back and forth so pick a point of view and stick to it in your writing Okay, let's review. So again, 
the basis of all this is understanding that the subject and verb or subject and predicate of a sentence, that's the grammatical structure, and you want to try to align that with the characters and actions of your story. That is the people that you're talking about or beings that you're talking about and the things that they're doing. So you want to make your main characters the subjects of your sentences. And you want to make sure you pair those main characters with active verbs, verbs that accurately describe what they're doing. You want to try to avoid nominalizations and abstractions, except in certain situations where they're necessary or you need to use them. We talked about some of those in this uh, presentation. We talked about some of those in a previous presentation. And when the main character is an abstract noun, when you are talking about an abstraction like freedom of speech or existentialism or uh, courage or anything like that, anything that's an abstract concept, you want to avoid using too many other abstractions or nominalizations because that'll just be too much uh, abstraction, too, much, uh, too many ideas for your reader to kind of balance. They need something more material, more concrete to help uh, understand an abstract concept. Also, in terms of review, remember the active voice is usually preferable to passive voice, and that's where the agent is um, uh, clearly identified and their action is clearly identified and the goal of their action is clearly identified. Passive voice is, of course, where the place of the agent and the goal, the place of the doer and the thing done to are reversed, so it it, it focuses our attention on the goal of the action. So use passive voice when the agent of the action is unknown, when it's self-evident, like it's the court or the allies, something like that, or if it's unimportant, it doesn't matter who, who the agent is. Um, you could use passive voice if it replaces a long subject with a shorter one. So that was that example of uh, the, the uh, decision um, being based on whether we blah, blah, blah. That was, it was not only about new information versus old information. It was also about replacing a simple subject that's much easier to understand, uh, or excuse me, replacing a long subject that's very complex with a, a short, much simpler subject that's easier to understand. And finally, you want to use passive voice when it provides a coherent sequence of subjects, such as um, we will decide, our decision will be based or will be determined, it provides a consist consistent sequence of subjects, point of view, a coherent sequence of ideas where familiar information always precedes uh, the new information. So those are the main reasons why you want to use passive voice or why you might want to use passive voice. So with that said, that's the end of our presentation. If you have any questions and you're my student, you know how to get in touch with me. Otherwise, I wish you the day you wish yourselves, and I will see you in class soon.